Hello again, this is Mike with Toy Train Tips and Tricks. And today we are continuing the series on layout planning, going through the steps that I went through to plan the new version of my fun lines layout that I began actual construction uh, one year ago this month. So these are the steps that I went through to plan the layout to make sure that it was going to be as successful as possible and to make it what I wanted it to be and not something that after I had put up the bench work, decided uh, this wasn't going to work and tear it down. So I wanted something that was going to be as successful, as enjoyable as possible. So here in part three, we're looking at wiring systems, and part of that is going to be your choice of control system. That will impact not only your wiring, but also your track plan and certainly your budget. So let's look at your control system choices. There's basically two categories, command control and conventional control. We'll look at conventional control first because it's the oldest. And in conventional control, the speed of the locomotive is controlled strictly by the voltage coming from the transformer or power pack. You move the lever up, the motor goes faster, the locomotive speeds up, you move the lever down, the voltage decreases, the locomotive slows down or stops. Direction can be controlled either by the power pack in DC operations by changing the polarity or in AC operations by an onboard reverse unit, often called an E unit. Conventional control has its advantages. First of all, it is less expensive. Uh, it, it's not as complicated to just, you have a transformer, you have a motor. Not much complexity to that. It is backwards compatible. Uh, all the way back to the beginning of uh, model train production in 1900, and conventional control works. And there's less maintenance and it's easier to repair because the motors are simple and the circuits that are involved are generally easily available, easy to repair with a few exceptions. Um, most of the maintenance can be done by you know anyone with a screwdriver with can of contact cleaner or WD-40, and you can pretty much get these locomotives, these conventional control locomotives, running on their feet again. Disadvantages, well, you know, there's a lot of really cool special effects in today's locomotives and today's command control, and conventional control locomotives just don't have that. Um, also, if you're running multiple trains on the same track, it does require some special wiring, which we're going to get into. Uh, and more complex layouts may become more expensive because you're using more wire, more electrical switches, relays, things like that, than you would with command control. And also your lights and your smoke effects, uh, things like lighted spotlight cars and smoke in the steam locomotives, that's all dependent upon the train speed, how much voltage is going to the track will impact your light intensity and your smoke intensity. So those are some disadvantages to conventional control. Command control is any system where the locomotive speed, direction, special effects are all controlled by an onboard microprocessor that is activated by some sort of separate controller. It can be radio control, it can be Wi-Fi, it can be Bluetooth, sometimes it, the signal goes through the track. Any of these systems fall under the umbrella of command control. There are different types, different versions. All of them don't play with each other, uh, but they're all out there, and these are all different versions of command control. Command control has a lot of advantages. First of all, the special effects. There are some really cool sound, smoke, light, and remote coupler effects that you can do with command control because you have that microprocessor on board the locomotive, things that you just can't accomplish with conventional control. The wiring for the layout is simpler. All you need for command control is a hot and a common going to your track at constant voltage and the computer, the microprocessor and your controller do the rest of the work. Therefore, it's very easy to do multiple train control on the same track next to each other because each locomotive is receiving its own signals from the microprocessors and their own controllers, and so it doesn't matter where they are on the track. They, they You can stop them, you can start them, you can crash them into each other like Gomez Adams. Anything you want to do can be done uh, very easily in multi-train control. And this makes walk-around control uh, very, very simple. 
uh, because you're already using a wireless system. And since you've got those cool special effects, you want to be up by the locomotive anyway as you walk around the layout. And the light and smoke effects of even your conventional equipment, like spotlight cars and smoking cabooses and things like that, are on full intensity regardless of the train speed. Your smoke intensity is not controlled by the voltage to the track, but is controlled by uh, a command to the command board. It's totally independent from train speed. So you can have a train, a steam locomotive just crawling along and putting out huge plumes of smokes. So these are all advantages of command control. So clearly with all of these features, command control has the disadvantage of being more expensive. Uh, it just costs more to do all of those cool things. The microprocessor is a lot more expensive than a mechanical E unit, a mechanical reverse unit. Secondly, they can be difficult and sometimes even impossible to repair if something goes wrong. These microprocessors are uh, very complex and sometimes they can be just out of date. A 15 or 20 year old circuit board that has a problem, you're probably not going to find a replacement part for it which gets us to component longevity and obsolescence. How long is that command control board going to be around? You can take post-war and even pre-war Lionel locomotives and run them on a contemporary layout. How old of a command control locomotive will, will function? And when they do, will they seem obsolete, out of date, uh, comparing a, a state-of-the-art MTH uh, DCS locomotive to, say, PS1 or PS2 of a few years ago, it's night and day. And those components generally aren't available anymore, uh, except you might be able to find a spare one on eBay somewhere or scrap one from uh, another locomotive. Another disadvantage is that running command control may require extra equipment to run conventional control locomotives if you have a collection of those. Some systems do, some systems don't. It's different. I'm not going to get into all the differences. Uh, some of them are very compatible with conventional control. Some mm, less so. You, you can generally get there, but sometimes you have to add extra boxes, extra expense. And some systems are not completely compatible with one another. Um, using a, a DCS locomotive with a Lionel Odyssey or even a Lionel TMCC, um, versus a lion chief. There are some things that just don't work one with another because they're all different systems. Uh, not going to get in again to all the complexities of that, but that is a problem with command control. Uh, and so that's why I use conventional control uh, exclusively on my layout. Maybe someday I will switch. Maybe someday I'll catch the command control bug and then it'll be very easy to add that to my layout by just wiring it in, but I use conventional wiring. And so there are two basic thoughts, two ways you can go with conventional wiring. The first is what used to be called block control. It's more of a territory or loop control. And under this system, each particular section of track, whether that's a loop or a territory, a part of a large layout, each of these areas is controlled by an individual transformer. So each throttle controls a particular territory, regardless of how many trains are on that particular track. Whether it's zero, one, two, three, four, there's one throttle dedicated to that section of track, regardless of the train that is there. Uh, and so here is an example. This is an actual, a Lionel, a pre-war actually Lionel wiring diagram showing how to use one of their dual control transformers uh, instead of using two separate transformers, you can use one that has two throttles built in to operate two loops. And essentially, one throttle is wired to the inner loop. One throttle is wired to the outer loop. Uh, and they are insulated from one another by these insulating pins at the important junctions here. And so you can have a train running on the outside, a train running on the inside independently of one another. But if the train on the outside wants to come inside and take this reverse loop during the period that it's in here, it's under the jurisdiction of the other throttle. So you have issues of, well, one, if 
instead of having a double throttle, imagine you have two people running throttles on either end of the layout. And this person who's been running their train when they cross in this territory, suddenly they no longer have control of the train. This guy over here does. Um, so you've got to, to try to match the speed to not cause it to realm up that way. Um, and who knows if they're paying attention. And you know, so, so that's the issue with that. The trains traveling between territories will be controlled by different throttles in each territory. If you go from the outside in, you're crossing over from throttle A to throttle B and vice versa. So um, that's one of the, the disadvantages. Now, one other thing that you can add with any of these conventional systems is a holding track, which is essentially a section of track that has an on-off switch where you can park a train and turn the power off and leave it there until you need it and then turn the power back on. And uh, they show this in this wire diagram right down here. They added a couple of single pole double throw switches, basically like on-off light switches. One to control this track section. And again, there's some insulating pins right there to separate that. And the center rail is wired there. And then this one controls this one way over here. So you can park a train here or you can park a train here, turn them on or off. Uh, but again, you've got one train controlling, one throttle controlling the outside loop which would be both of these held sections and one controlling the inside loop. If you're running on the outside, you can send your train to the inside, but you won't have control over it. The inside throttle will. So as we look at block and territory control, the advantages are you can have multi train running and the wiring for that is simple. You just send hot and common to one loop. You send hot and common to another loop from a different transformer or the opposite side of a multi-control transformer. Um, and you're ready to go. You insulate the, the junction between the two, no problem. Um, fewer operators are required. You don't have to have a dispatcher. One person can run two throttles or three throttles or four throttles or five throttles. And you don't have to worry about throwing switches in between to get from loop to loop. You just throw the switch and let the train go. And you just have to make sure that the, the territories are roughly the same voltage as you run from area to area. And this system is sufficient for most small layouts. And especially for if you're a template style operator with just multiple loops, what I like to call display mode for the trains, just running loop, 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 loop. This system works great. And it again, it's pretty easy uh, to wire and it's efficient for most. Um, so some of the disadvantages are if you want to run two or more independent trains on, in a given territory, it really doesn't work for that. Anytime you have two trains in that same territory, they're going to be controlled off of the one throttle. And there's not a thing you can do about that. So if you want to run two trains on one loop, um, there's, they're going to be run off of one throttle. The operator must surrender throttle control in a new territory. It goes out of their territory. Then somebody else has control of their train. Uh, and it's not really suited for walk around control. You're pretty much tied to your one territory. It's hard to control your train from across the room. So those are some of the disadvantages. But again, for a small layout or if you're just running loops and loops and loops, not a problem. The next step from this is what we call cab control. This is still a conventional method. But with cab control, the sections, the territories are smaller. They're what we call blocks, and they can be controlled by multiple throttles, two, three, four, five, six, however many. These are called cabs. So each cab, each throttle controls a train, regardless of where it is on the layout. And the operator can follow the train around the layout. And it doesn't matter which territory you go into, you can still maintain control of your train. And here's how that is done. So let's take a look at my layout here. This is um, no longer, this is the basic track plan. It's not, I made some changes since I drew this. Um, and then here is my control panel that I made for cab control operation. Now just imagine taking this bridge section and cutting the layout in half here and then stretching it all out into a straight line. And that's what we have here. Here's our, basically our outside track. Here's our inside track. And so this little junction here is right here. These are the crossovers right here. And here's my yard here. Okay, so stretch it out. Here's my schematic as the train goes around. Uh, and you see 
Uh, the red buttons are control turnouts. These rotary knobs control my individual blocks. And notice like this block here, there's an insulated section there, insulated section here. So this block goes from here to here. So looking at my track plan here, if I have my train here, I can choose one of five different throttles. There's actually six spots, but I'm using five to control my train. So I'm on say throttle five with my train going this way. I would turn this rotary to number five. Before I cross over my insulated section, I set this one to number five. And then it depends on which direction I'm going. I'm going this way, I do number five here, number five here and continue on. If I'm taking the crossovers and these little R's here say that those are placeholders for rotaries that are coming later, number five here, number five here and so forth. Or if I were just going down here to this track, I would just go this far. And I had a different train sitting here. He could be on throttle one, two, three or four waiting for me to clear up and then I switch uh, the, the rotaries for that. And so I could have in theory, five different trains at a time uh, here on the layout. In practical application, uh, I'm pretty much limited to three uh, just because of the size of the layout. Um, but in theory, if I were really good at switching either end, I could have, uh, you know, somebody switching the yard, one here, one here, one passing using that. So I could have four, possi possibly five uh, independent trains running on this layout at any one time, depending on how good I was at running these rotary switches. And so that's the idea behind cab control is as your train travels, you make the blocks match the throttle, the cab for that locomotive, similar to the way an actual dispatcher will line up the signals and line up the switches for a prototype train to route the way it's supposed to. Uh, so you're routing trains and holding trains at junctions, just like a real dispatcher would in cab control. Uh, here's a, a better close up of it. And uh, so again, each of these is a rotary switch. These are six position, um, double pole, six throw rotary switches. I'm not using the second pole right now. Maybe later I will use it for signal or some other operation. And these three are for the yard. I didn't have enough room to put them in here. So I put them separately and there will be rotaries here. The red buttons are for turnouts. And uh, I've got a video showing more detail on how my wiring system works, if you are interested. So cab control, the advantages, it's possible to run two or three or four, depending on how big your loop is. More than two trains are possible per loop, still using conventional control. The operator controls the same train regardless of which territory you're in. Doesn't matter if I'm on the outside loop, the inside loop, on a siding in the yard, my operator on my one throttle controls that given train, provided the dispatcher throws the um, rotaries the proper way. This facilitates walk around operation if you have a wireless throttle or a, a long tethered throttle, because you can follow your train around as it goes from block to block to block. And it adds some additional operation, uh, a dispatcher. So you can have one additional person working on your layout as the full-time dispatcher uh, with two or three or four operators that you're uh, working with, uh, you know, or one person, you know, does both. Now, just to go back to this, you can still use the regular territory operation with this, which is what I'm doing now. You see, I haven't installed rotaries on this loop yet. All of these blocks are wired together to my throttle number three. So essentially I'm running one loop off of throttle three and the other loop, actually I'm you know, using multiple throttles up here, but before I had these rotaries in, I had one transformer assigned to this loop, one transformer assigned to this loop, and I was running that territory control until I added the rotary. So you don't have to do it all from the very beginning. This is a system that you can add as you go along. So the disadvantages of cab control, first of all, the wiring is more complex. It's a little harder to do. It becomes more expensive because there's more wire, there's more switches, there's more controls to have to keep track of uh, and to buy. And the operation itself becomes more complex because you have to have someone throwing the switches to route the trains. You can't just turn them on and let them go. Or actually you can. Uh, in my case, I like, I set my layout up for operation either way. 
most of the time in my busy day, when I go to the layout, I'll only have 10, 15, 20 minutes max to enjoy the layout at any given time. So when I'm doing that, then loop to loop operation is just fine. I'll set one loop all up for one throttle and the other loop all up for the other throttle and I'll just run it loop to loop operation, what I call display mode, just like regular territory operation. However, once in a while, I do have a block of time, an afternoon, an evening, a couple of hours. And when I have that kind of time, I do prefer, uh, because I once was into HO, uh, I've been contaminated and I do some prototype operation. And this layout, this cab control and this layout, this track plan allows me to do that as well. I can work it either way. So when I wanna be complex, either by myself or if I've got friends over, and I want to keep three or four or five people occupied running the trains, uh, I can give them different throttles, have someone be the dispatcher controlling all the operations. Or if it's just me, I set it up for loop to loop, grab my double, twin control throttle and go to town. Uh, it gives me flexibility to go either way. So regardless of which way you go, whether it's command, whether it's territory control, whether it's cab control, there are some things that you really need to do, some tips. This works for any layout. First of all, phase your AC transformers. If you've got more than one transformer, if you're not running everything off of a ZW with all of your accessories and everything else, if you have two or more transformers um, and you're using AC operation, this isn't for HO or N modelers using DC, uh, phase your transformers. AC power, unlike DC, which is, uh, to simplify things, DC kind of has a direction, positive to negative. AC goes back and forth. That's why fluorescent lights hum. That's why certain appliances hum. Your transformer hums because essentially, again, this is simplifying things. I don't want to get electrical engineers writing me nasty notes, but essentially the polarity is changing back and forth in the United States 60 times a second. Um, and so when you have multiple transformers, you want them to be changing direction at the same time in the same direction. And so phasing is very important. If you don't know how to do that, right at the top of your screen, follow that little link to a video that shows you how to do it. But it's very important if you're using two or more AC transformers. Second, do yourself a favor and use common bus wiring. Now the asterisk is there because certain command control systems don't like common bus wiring. So if you're going to go command control, look at the details of how they prefer to have it wired before you commit to this step. Uh, most of them can use common bus, but some of them don't like it very well. Um, but if you can use common bus wiring, oh, it saves so much wire. It saves time, it saves hassle, and it saves a lot of expense of buying extra wire because you run the one bus, all of your common side, whether it's the outside rail of the track or the common side of your accessories, everything goes to that one bus, which connects to your transformers. You just find the shortest route to the bus. You don't have to worry about running that wire all the way back to your transformer every single time. You just go to the closest common, even, sometimes even to the track is the closest common. It makes it so much easier. Do it if you can. Another important tip, make a diagram. I keep a notebook underneath the layout with all of my wiring diagrams and parts diagrams for different locomotives, instructions for the accessories, but make a wiring diagram. What you're doing may make perfect sense to you today and you say, well, I don't need a diagram for that. I'm just running this wire to this wire. But when you come back six months from now, when something doesn't work, you'll want to have that diagram just to verify what goes to what. Don't trust your memory make a diagram. You don't know how long it's going to be before you get back. You may be interrupted in the middle of the project and forget how you were doing it. Make a diagram. It'll save you a lot of headache later. Avoid spaghetti. Avoid wires going everywhere. Don't, don't fall for the temptation of just quickly running the fastest route from point A to point B. Figure out a more of wiring super highways. Use um, uh, different types of, there are lots of different types of clips that you can use. I 3D print mine. Um, and it may cost you a few inches of wire to go the extra distance to keep it on kind of your super highway as you go under the layout. But 
it will make it so much easier not to trace wires. It'll make it neater. You won't get tangled up under there. It'll be easier to figure out what's going on. Make a plan and stick to it. Avoid spaghetti. Don't just say, oh, I'm only doing this temporarily to get here to here to do it quickly. Avoid that temptation. Do it right the first time. Make it neat. It'll pay off dividends. And especially, this really should be the first tip, don't be cheap on the wiring. Don't use a 24 gauge wire to be your main track power. Um, <laughs> you know, use certainly no smaller than 16, 14 is good for most people. Some people even use 12 gauge lamp cord for the wiring. Um, the smaller wire you use, it may be cheaper today, but you're going to have problems down the road. One, that smaller wire isn't made to handle the type of amperage that we use. And so that builds up heat, which builds resistance, which takes power away from your locomotives. Secondly, yes, it can get hot. Yes, it can, in some circumstances, become a fire hazard. So don't be cheap on the wiring. Spend what you need to to get the gauge wire you need. Uh, again, for power feeders, depending on the size of the layout, the distance of your run, and how much power you're running through it, Certainly no smaller than 16 gauge for your for your track. 14's better. Uh, you can get away with using smaller wire on some of the accessories because it may be an on-off, a, a, a quick hit, such as for a switch machine. Yeah, with that, you could probably get away with a 22 gauge or a 24 gauge, something like that, um, because the voltage is, is only intermittent and not long-term. It has time to dissipate the heat. But... Don't be cheap on the wiring. Don't go with the cheapest wire you can find. Get the good stuff, and it will pay off dividends later. So that wraps up part three. Coming soon, part four, we'll talk about operation and modeling concepts. What thoughts went into my plan for operation on the layout? What do I mean by prototype operation? And what are some other things that you might think about if you're going to be doing more modeling and less toy train running? How, how do you decide on a, a time period or do you decide on a time period? How do you decide what equipment to buy and how to model your particular layout, how to express the idea that you want to express? So that's coming in part four, operation and modeling concepts. Until then, that's all for this episode. I hope you like it. If you do, please like it, share it, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Until then, keep the trains running, and we'll catch you next time on Toy Train Tips and Tricks.